I discovered a leak in my oxyacetylene lines that I think I just fixed. The oxy line was pretty bad, but the acetylene also had a small leak that took some soapy water to find that one. I should probably change these lines out all together. These aren't that expensive. Maybe a dollar or two a foot, depending on the size. At any rate, a lot less expensive than blowing yourself up. Maybe a bit more hassle, but definitely less expensive. So since I have all this stuff out, let's talk about oxyacetylene, shall we? Before I got the TIG, this was my go-to welding rig for small stuff. Now it's mostly relegated to heating, heating and bending, brazing, cutting, and just general burninating and melting. Before we get into the business end of things, let's take another look at the bottles. Let's start there. Ignore that bottle on the left. That's nitrogen, N2. I use that to fill my air guns. You're looking at oxygen in the middle and acetylene on the right, the short one. N. A. Ch. Notch. Do you know why acetylene is called acetylene? Do you know why it smells the way it does? Well, neither do I. But what I do know is, just like my boy, it's chained nice and solid to the wall. They're not just sort of floating around, hanging back here in the dark part of my shop on their own, where a yank with the hose or a bump could knock them over. If there's anything you take away from this video is that oxyacetylene and high pressure cylinders in general have the potential to be extremely dangerous, but they're safe if they're used with caution, common sense, and you play by the rules. Let's start with oxygen. Oxygen is a gas, and a new bottle is usually filled to about 2,000 PSI, give or take. That's about 140 bar, and that's a lot of pressure. To get that down to something we can work with, we need a regulator. A regulator is a thing that looks like a clock stuck to the top of the tank. Welding regulators have two gauges. Usually the one closer to the valve tells you the pressure in the bottle, or the cylinder as the pros call them. You can tell I'm not a pro. The other gauge tells you the working pressure coming into the hoses. Welding regulators are adjustable. You turn the knob, change the working pressure, easy peasy. My oxygen is currently set to about 5 PSI. The regulator is regulating high pressure oxygen. 2000 PSI for a new bottle, down to 5 PSI. Now let's have a look at the acetylene. In the bottle, acetylene isn't a gas. Well it is, but it's dissolved in a liquid. It's dissolved in acetone. Well it's complicated. Acetylene is unstable above 15 to 20 PSI or so. So it can't be shipped on its own like oxygen is. I've got my Craftsman X-ray inspection tool. Let's have a look inside. Inside the steel shell of the cylinder is a porous matrix. Kind of like that big hard sponge you have in the utility sink. You really should throw that away. It's getting kind of gross. The matrix is filled with acetone. Don't quote me on this, but it might be about 50% acetone. The acetylene gas is dissolved into that acetone. Sort of like CO2 is dissolved in your soda before you open it. That makes sense? When you crack the can open, the CO2 starts to bubble out. That's more or less what happens with acetylene. That's what keeps it stable. That, by the way, is also the reason you should never use acetylene bottles on their side, or after they've been laying on their side, like in the trunk of your car. You should let them settle overnight or so. Now, I know there's someone out there right now commenting that they've used their acetylene bottle completely upside down, hanging from their ceiling for the past 30 years, and nothing bad's ever happened. The point is, you shouldn't do it. It's very dangerous. Anyway, just like the Oxy bottle, this also has a regulator. The scale is a little bit different because of the operating pressures of acetylene, but it's the same principle. And again, mine is currently set to about 5 PSI. My rig is actually a little bit big for the kind of stuff that I do these days. Though honestly, I've never really done very big work. I mean, this is by no means a big torch, but I would love one of those little mini oxyacetylene torches. The good ones are just so dang expensive though. But these things are so versatile, I wouldn't be without one. I mean, if you've ever watched the A-Team, you know just how multifunctional and plot critical an oxyacetylene torch can be. In order to provide you with the absolute most bang for your YouTube buck, and to stretch the soup a little bit, let's get a smidge techie here. Let's get into the numbers. Now, just like the Wonder Twins, acetylene and oxygen, on their own, are absolutely marvelous. But you put them together, 
And that's when the magic happens. Acetylene is C2H2, and oxygen is O2. When you put those together and burn them, like any hydrocarbon, you get carbon dioxide and water, CO2 and H2O. I'm sure you probably get all sorts of other weird stuff, but the majority will be CO2 and H2O. What we just wrote here is a bit of an equation, but if you look close, both sides aren't balanced. We have more C's, H's, and O's on one side than we do on the other. Hey, that reminds me of that old joke. Uh, how did it go? What did the baby acorn say when it grew up? Stoichiometry. No, wait, wait. I told that wrong. What did the baby Russian acorn say? I don't know. Let's move on. Let's see what happens when we try to balance our checkbook here. It's been a while, but we'll start with the O2. That looks easy. Sitting there all by itself. Now, on the left, we have one O2. Two oxygen atoms. On the right, we have two in the carbon dioxide and one in the water. So there's three there. We can't add another oxygen by itself on the left, so let's double the H2O, just to even it all out. Now we have four oxygen on the right. We'll add a two on the left to get us two O2s. So four oxygen atoms on the left, four oxygen atoms on the right. And when we doubled that water, we also doubled the hydrogens. So let's double the number of hydrogens we have on the left. Two H2s on the left in the acetylene, and two H2s on the right in the water. So now what happened? We've got the oxygen sorted out, we've got the hydrogen sorted out, but when we doubled the H2s on the left, we also doubled the carbons. We essentially have four on the left in the acetylene and one on the right in the CO2. So let's put four carbon atoms on the right-hand side to match the four carbon atoms on the left. Just like before, we fixed the carbons, but we broke the oxygens. On the right, we now have four O2s from the carbon dioxide and one O2 from the water for a total of five oxygen pairs on the right. Let's just change our two to a five, and I think this thing's worked out now. We have the same number of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens on the left than we do on the right. Now, if you're wondering why I went through all of this, I can't blame you. But take a look at what happened. In order to get complete combustion of the acetylene and the oxygen, for every two parts of acetylene, we need five parts of oxygen to completely burn it. And if we set up our torch to do that, to sort of meter those proportions of acetylene and oxygen, we end up with what's called a neutral flame. And we'll see that in a minute when we light her up. A neutral flame produces carbon dioxide and water. Alternatively, you could adjust the torch so you have an excess of oxygen or an excess of acetylene. If you have too much oxygen, you have an oxidizing flame. If you have too much acetylene, you have a carburizing flame. All right, well, we're not quite down to brass tacks, but we are almost cooking with gas. I picked up some new tips for my torch. Tips can be cleaned with a special tip cleaner, but sooner or later they wear out and you need new ones. Tips are sized by orifice diameter, either the size of the hole or some made-up number, like a number two or a number four. The local shop didn't have all the tips that I needed, but he did have this sweet-sized nozzle at a really good price. I think I'm going to get to like this one. It's now my smallest one. What you're looking at is three nozzles for heating and welding or brazing and a cutting head. We'll get to this later. The largest one you see here is the one that gets the most use, at least for me. For heating and brazing, you kind of want a large soft flame. Instead of a needle-like pinpoint, you might want for welding. Let's get the small one on and light it up. Now the torch has two knobs on it, one for each gas, and I'll be using these to adjust the balance for the flame. Now because this is a smaller tip, I've also dropped the pressure at the regulators. The working pressures you set on the regulator are based on the tip or the nozzle, and that's sort of based on the work you're trying to do. The bigger the work, the bigger the tip, the higher the pressure. Check the literature from your torch manufacturer to find out exactly what pressures those should be. Those are very important to both your safety and having a good time with one of these things. You should use a striker to light up your torch. I've always been taught not to light a torch with an open flame, like a lighter, for example. And I'm not exactly sure why that is, to be honest. If anybody knows the sort of official reason, I'd love to hear about it. The only thing I've ever been able to think of is maybe the torch pressure could blow out your open flame. Like you try to light your torch with your lighter and it just blows the lighter out like a birthday candle. Then you might be in a situation where you've got your torch, you know, putting out a deadly mix of acetylene and oxygen, and you're, you know, trying to strike your lighter back up. Anyway, I'm going to light just the acetylene. I don't know how well you can see it, but 
there's a lot of soot coming off of that flame. That's all carbon. Now what you're looking at here is the acetylene flame from before. No oxygen. And you're looking through a pair of welding goggles. I'm going to start to slowly open the oxygen up. And you may or may not see three flame cones in there. The outer cone, the inner cone, and the smallest one nearest the nozzle. I can continue to open the oxygen until that middle cone and the small cone sort of become one. Right there our checkbook is balanced and we have a neutral flame. This is the flame you'd use probably 99% of the time. Now there's something else going on here you may have never thought about. The flame is conveniently staying put. It's attached to the tip of the nozzle. Now what's happening is there's a flame front. The flame is trying to burn its way up that gas. Sort of like when you light a fuse, the fire you know, would run up the fuse. The flame isn't moving because the gas is coming at it as fast as it's trying to burn it. In our fuse analogy, the fuse is moving closer to the fire at the same speed that the fire is trying to climb up the fuse. So we have a bit of a balancing act. The gas coming out the nozzle at a certain speed and the flame trying to burn its way back into that gas. If the pressure is set too low on your regulators, you could end up in a situation where that flame speed exceeds the speed of the gas and the flame comes into the nozzle, comes into the torch. It starts to burn its way up to that fuse, back to the bottles. That gave me chills just saying that out loud. The term for that is flashback. And in your lines at some point, maybe two points, you should have installed flashback arresters. These are basically like thermal check valves that should break the link if a flame makes it this far back in the tubing. So my hoses are springing more leaks. The guy at the welding supply laughed at me. You know, I was in there not two days ago. The guy said, these nozzles look pretty old. You sure your hoses are still okay? And I said, yeah, I want some cheesy poofs. Yeah, my hoses are still okay. Don't try to upsell me, I'm not an idiot. So I went in, got new hose, and he upsold me on new flashback arresters. So all kidding aside, what I'm really trying to do here is maybe provide some additional insight, some information you might not find in other videos. There's literally a ton of videos on YouTube on this subject, and I know because I've weighed them. All right, so it's been a while, but I've got just some scraps of steel. I'll try to lay down some welds. And when you light the torch, start with the fuel first, with the acetylene. Some people like to open both of these so they're not getting as sooty a flame and making a mess, but that's actually quite dangerous. The acetylene on its own, at the pressures we'll be welding with, isn't as dangerous as an oxyacetylene mix. To keep it from making such a mess, just open it up a little bit more. So a small flame, pretty dirty. Give it some pressure, it starts to clean up. And like before, slowly add the oxygen or reduce the acetylene to get the balance right, to get us to a neutral flame. I'd hope this would go without saying, but I'm going to say it. The flame is very hot. I mean, if you've never used an oxyacetylene torch before, you likely have no real reference for just how hot this thing is. You don't have to take my word for it. Let's see what the thermal camera says. Be very mindful of where you point this thing. I know, I know, it'll be just a second. You just need that one thing a couple of steps away. You'll just put the torch down and be right back. If it's not in your hand, turn the torch off. Then you give it a minute to start the puddle and just let the puddle tell you when it's time to move on or add filler. Maybe easier said than done, but that's the moral of the story. All right, that was actually harder than I remembered it. I actually did three in order to get sort of the shots you just saw in the video. Compared to the TIG torch, this thing weighs a ton. Feels like I'm trying to arm wrestle somebody while I'm welding. I still think oxyacetylene is the way to start. I think gas welding gives you a little bit more insight into what's happening and gives you a little bit more time to respond and develop sort of the skills in the eye to recognize what's going on and adjust for it. And I think it's a more intuitive sense of like heat control, the torch angle, you know, stuff that happens 
lightning fast maybe with TIG and especially with MIG, but maybe that's just the way I came into the hobby. So I just put the cutting head on. It might look a little complicated, but there's really not too much to it. Anyway, same adjustments as before. Acetylene and oxygen to get us to a neutral flame. And then there's an additional oxygen valve. Now cutting requires a lot more oxygen than welding did. Even a modest size tip like this, I don't remember the number exactly, but this will cut some ridiculous thickness of steel. Let's take a look at the difference between a welding head and a cutting head. The welding head has only one orifice on the center. The cutting head has a lot more than one. The six jets around the perimeter are sort of the preheat flame. That's where your heat's coming from. And the jet in the middle is oxygen. That's what'll be doing the cutting. The reason this has holes all the way around that center point, the center hole, is to allow you to move in any direction with the torch. Like you could cut a circle by standing in one place without having to walk completely around your workbench. Now in my particular torch, I open the oxygen on the body or the handle all the way and let the one on the cutting head control the mixture. The button serves as a bypass. It steps right around that button and sends sort of your full pressure air through the cut. Just like before, you adjust the oxygen and acetylene balance to sort of reduce that inner cone to match, in this case, the six cones around the edge to get the neutral flame. You can push the button once or twice and see what the balance looks like when you have excess oxygen and tweak it if you like. The torch will and should sound a little more violent when you hit the lever and you start running higher pressure oxygen through that tip. Now to be honest, I'm a little hesitant about doing this cutting here in my garage. This is going to shoot sparks everywhere. I've kind of barricaded the top of my workbench. I'm going to try to keep this to a minimum, but you know, what kind of video would it be if I didn't do any cutting? I'm going to start off by letting the jets heat up the work, sort of melt the steel. When I see a small puddle has started to form, I can hit the lever and start cutting. Here's a little interesting tidbit. Once that steel starts cutting, once it's started to melt, you technically don't need the acetylene anymore. I remember my instructor was particularly fond of doing that demonstration. As he was cutting, he'd cut the acetylene and finish the cut with just the oxygen. Basically, once the material gets to sort of that auto ignition temperature, the temperature where it would just sort of spontaneously burn, as long as you feed it enough oxygen, it'll keep burning on its own. When you make a cut with an oxyacetylene torch, you're basically making it rust very, very, very fast until it breaks apart in two pieces. And I didn't get into a lot of the very specific details. It was more about the torch and the torch setup. And maybe it helps make a little bit more sense of some of the terms and reasoning you might hear on other YouTube channels. I happen to really like Jody over Welding Tips and Tricks and would highly recommend his channel to anyone interested in welding or fabricating in general. All right, so what did you think of that? Did you learn something? Cool. No.